Board of the meeting of the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District Board of Managers, November 16, 2017. All managers are present. There is no member of the public here to speak. Um, is there a motion to approve the agenda with the addition of um, an action item carried over from our previous meeting, which would be, um, excuse me a moment for the right wording here, um, a Big Island Nature Park Conservation Easement letter. That would be added at 11.2. I would make that motion. Thank you, Manager Becker. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Um, we have no information items this evening. <coughs> On the consent agenda is approval of the minutes of the November 9th board meeting, the general checking account, surety account check register, and 325 Blake Road checking account. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Is there a question? Thank you for the second. Um, yes, uh, Madam President, I think Council is just going to remind me that there is a slight update to the um, check register that, um, that there was a, in, in terms of tallying the, the uncontested fees uh, for the Minnesota unemployment, um, there was a second check added to that because it didn't total the right, there's just uh, two additional ones on the back side of the page that weren't, uh, weren't part of the first check, so there are two checks, um, the first for the, in the amount of $6,632.26, and the second in the amount of $1,491.15, which equals the total obligation um, that was not being contested. Thank you. Um, can you have that? Should I, um, can we still take that as a consent agenda? All right, any questions? Manager Olson? Does this include the minutes? Um, yes, it does. I have a correction on the minutes. It said that Bill Olson voted no. On the IT plan, now it is affirmative. Okay, what line would that be? I'm looking for it. <coughs> uh, page 8, line 318. Is that the one where? That's it. There it is. Thank you. So I was one of the affirmatives. It was somebody else who I, uh, suggested to the council who was here last week that I believe it was um, Manager Olson voting in the affirmative and Manager Ragnus voting in to the negative, I believe. Okay. As we, the, 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 the flow was going on. I think that's Thank the direction. You. So for Ragnus, we'll uh, put, or for Olson, we'll put Ragnus? She Shackleton Loftus, Ragnus opposed. Yes. Correct. Miller abstaining. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And this is important, why? So with those, with that change to the check register and that um, change to the minutes, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. <coughs> Under updates, um, I want to mention two upcoming discussions just to prompt some thinking about it. We'll be looking at the 2018 meeting schedule on the 14th of December. So it's a time to think about meeting start times, um, maybe some other issues that relate to, uh, do we still want to call the first board meeting a workshop? And I don't mean to make it a discussion item now, but just to flag that as something to think about. And then, um, uh, gosh, that's all I had. <laughs> oh, we'll be looking at an annual governance policy review in January. Um, so just, you know, if you want to do your homework beforehand. Maybe we'll just pass it without comment, but we need to put it in our agenda and do that to satisfy our own governance policies. So that is um, the two items I want to flag, the governance items. And then um, the CAC uh, focus group um, will be uh, scheduled and used to appoint a couple of managers, two or three managers. Now, are you interested? Um, I know that Manager Olson and Manager Miller are interested, but uh, Jekyllton and Loftus, are you interested? And being on a CAC focus group for the CAC role. Well, I'll certainly appoint then managers Olson and Miller. Um, if someone else is interested in joining, I think we could stretch it to three. I'm happy to. I, I mean, I like. I think a lot of context I would bring they have. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so Olson and Miller, 
Um, we'll be on that focus group then. Thank you very much for volunteering. Um, on plan planning and policy committee meeting, report manager Miller. Uh, we uh, had a long meeting. Uh, it just broke up uh, now. Uh, I don't have the agenda. Uh, but the... Uh, The uh, thing most noteworthy was the uh, uh, develop a uh, or began a discussion of uh, priorities and committee al alignments, uh, agenda priorities for the planning and policy committee for next year. And uh, in that discussion, we uh, uh, also brought up the the. Uh, Operations and Planning Com Committee, as well as the CAC, and try to get uh, their uh, their work programs and their uh, uh, objectives kind of meshing together, so that w the the uh, whole uh, organization can be moving in the same direction and in the same speed uh, with the uh, uh, with the clarity provided by each uh, committee and and the advisory committee. So. Uh, uh, I, we're, 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 we've just started that discussion and we'll be continuing that. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the upcoming uh, meeting and event schedule is, is um, in the agenda, showing through December. Again, it's a compressed month because of holidays, back-to-back -back meetings. Um, we're on to public hearings and presentations. We have the Six Mile Marsh Total Phosphorus Sink or Soluble Phosphorus Source. Ms. Dooley and Mr. Beck. President White Board Managers, I am Kelly Dooley, I work for, I, I'm in the Research and Monitoring Department, and this is Brian Beck from Wank Associates. Um, I just want to say thank you for uh, having allowing us to come present tonight. Um, research and Monitoring has been involved with planning and Wank Associates in diagnosing what, uh, the issues in Six Mile Creek Pulsed Base Watershed since 2012. And this recent analysis is another one of those examples where we were assisted with data collection and Wank we asked Wayne to do the analysis. Um, what you have seen the final results, results from this study um, through um, presentations that have been brought forward to you by planning staff. We wanted to bring this, um, give you, provide you a deeper dive into the study um, because this presentation was presented at the Water Resources Conference by Brian Beck, but also at the National, uh, National Lake Management Society in Denver, Colorado. So with that, um, just to give you, uh, I'm going to be doing the intro and the ending, and he'll be doing the middle of the presentation. So in 2013, the district um, initiated a diagnostic study. Um, we knew that there were six lakes impaired in the Six Mile Creek Halstead Base of Watershed. We didn't know why. Um, so the study identified that external loading from altered wetlands and stormwater runoff um, and then there was internal loading from common carp and internal sediment phosphorus loads, which is causing the problems on um, the majority of the sub-watershed. Um, there were still several unknowns in the Mud Lake area, Six Mile Marsh, and Halstead Bay. Um, the district received a clean water grant to help us diagnose what was going on in the Mud Lake um, area. <coughs> so now we know we need to address common carp, do some wetland, wet, wetland restoration, and to reduce loads from Parley Lake. Can, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, on the uh, the lake before uh, Six Mile Marsh, uh, it, is that a, a stream that comes in through there? Right here. No, from the Ooh, yeah. yeah. Oh, this right here. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. What's it called? Um, Manager Miller, Board of Managers. I am actually not aware of what that stream is called. I've never seen it before. It's, it's, a, it's an unnamed ditch. Yes. It's just a ditch. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
So in 2013, um, two um, feasibility studies were initiated to address um, the issues in Halstead Bay, to identify those issues. A um, new treatment budget was uh, computed for Halstead Bay, so we found out that 40% of the internal load, or 40% of the FOSS first load was internal, and 50% was coming from out upstream sources. Um, before you even address internal loads, we need to address the carp in Halstead Bay, as well as the upstream sources. So a secondary feasibility study um, provided some preliminary locations for the alum treatments, and they suggested the six mile marsh, which is pictured here. Um, we have property right here at the inlet of the marsh, so that was potential one location, and the other suggestion was at the outlet. Um, <coughs> so um, the district, with the diagnostic <coughs> study as well as the feasibility <coughs> studies, um, and uh, laid outlined an implementation strategy for this of watershed, so cart management and alum dosing in many of the lakes, um, wetland restoration and stormwater management to reduce loading to those lakes. Um, but all of that, all of that work will help improve water quality in Halstead Bay. But one area that still is unknown is the Six Mile Marsh. What do we need to be doing in Six Mile Marsh? Do we need to do a wetland restoration? Do we, where do we put the alum dosing treatment plants? Um, will doing all the upstream work be enough? So, planning and research and monitoring partnered together and we coordinated with Wink Associates and asked them to do some analysis. So, in, the questions were, is Six Mile Marsh a source or sink of phosphorus? And how much of that external Halstead Bay phosphorus budget is coming from the marsh? And with that, I'll let Eric or <laughs> Brian take over, sorry. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just going to talk about some of the findings that we had uh, during the study and some of the, the interpretations that we uh, made based on the data that mm -hmm. uh, uh, the staff had collected. So just generally in Minnesota, why do we care about wetlands and phosphorus? And uh, wetlands account for 10.6 million acres in Minnesota, and there's only 55 million acres, so a fifth of the land is wetlands. So clearly these are impacting how our, our landscape is assimilating phosphorus and changing phosphorus as it moves through our systems. And generally, the way that we think about it is that, well, wetlands are improving water quality because they're removing particulate material. However, there has been some evidence recently that uh, wetlands can act as uh, exporters of phosphorus. So the question for this was, is Six Mile Marsh uh, removing phosphorus, phosphorus or is it, is it exporting it? And so that's, that's the question that we wanted to answer more concretely. So when we think about wetlands and how they work, there's two general uh, things that are going on. So the two main bullet points are, is phosphorus being removed? So wetlands can remove phosphorus in several different ways. They can, uh, the phosphorus can stick to soils, it can settle out in the, in the wetland. In addition, phos phosphorus can ex be exported from wetlands. So uh, organic matter within the wetland or uh, when that phosphorus sticks to the soils, it can also come off in certain uh, situations. So we want to understand how much is going into the wetland, how much is settling out or staying there, and how much is leaving the wetland, and what form is it in. So a really, uh, the way that, an easy way to think about it is just a box model. How much is going in, what does it look like when it's going in, and what does it look like when it's going out? And the question is, based on how much is going in and how much is going out, can we start answering these other things what are the mechanisms that, that are going on in there? And that can help inform your management decisions uh, based on what are the mechanisms that are driving the phosphorus release or uh, the settling within your wetland. So, so understanding those mechanisms is really important. So uh, the staff went out and collected really, really good uh, water quality monitoring data in addition to flow monitoring um, at two sites. So, uh, they monitored flow within uh, Six Mile Marsh, and they did uh, phosphorus sampling upstream and downstream of Six Mile Marsh. So you can start getting a better understanding of what's going in and what's coming out. And just a point of reference, the upstream station is right off Highland Road on County Road 7, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Just a point of reference. Okay. Yep. So our initial results, so that we, uh, or uh, staff collected samples in 2013, 14, and 15. 
Uh, the light green is the inlet, so the one that was on the left, the gr uh, dark green is the outlet. And what you can see here is, based on the numbers, uh, on average, 115 pounds of total phosphorus is removed by this wetland. So what this is saying, if you just look at it kind of topically, is that yes, the wetland's removing phosphorus and 115 pounds <coughs> on average. So this is good news. This is kind of confirming what, we're, what we initially, or a lot of people think, is that it, uh, wetlands are removing phosphorus. This is good news. But we thought we'd dig a little bit deeper just to make sure uh, that we understand what's going on and we can start figuring out those mechanisms. Because if we go back to our, our box model, we can start putting in our numbers, right? We know the load going in, and we know the load coming out. And we know that's, it's on average, 115 pounds is being removed. But the problem is we're still not getting at some of those mechanisms, and we don't know how much particulate phosphorus and soluble or orthophosphorus is coming out of the wetland and going in. So luckily, they collected that data as well, which mm -hmm. was very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so we started splitting things up, and the orange, this is the same exact figure as the last one, right? So this is the inlet, and this is the outlet each year, and blue is particulate phosphorus, orange is orthophosphorus. And what you can see is, from inlet to outlet, particulate phosphorus is being removed by the wetland. We know that's happening. However, we see that orthophosphorus, each uh, from the inlet to outlet, is going up. So that means that the wetland is also exporting <coughs> soluble phosphorus. So it's telling us two different things are going on here. It's both removing particulate phosphorus and exporting soluble orthophosphorus, which is going to be really important, and I'll explain why that is. So uh, what we see is each year it's exporting uh, quite a lot of orthophosphorus, uh, which is undoing a little bit of that uh, removal, that, of that particulate removal. Just, I mean, I'm sorry for interrupting you. 2014 obviously is an almost year for a bunch of reasons, but is that just, is that really reflective of high water and that? Yes. Mm -hmm. That which is soluble. Super high water. Yeah. Yep, yep. And so you're inundating your wetland continuously then, so anaerobic conditions um, and when, when the wetland is regularly inundated is going to cause more export of phosphorus, whereas when you have a really dry year and it goes wet and dry, um, that, that reduces likely the amount of export you get of that soluble phosphorus. Ortho and soluble interchangeable. interchangeable. Thank you. Yep. It leads to algal blooms. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so this is the same figure. Uh, I just wanted to show it. Just orthophosphorus, taking out particular phosphorus. Can I ask a really dumb question? If it's the same as uh, solids, is that what you said? Soluble. 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 Okay, soluble. Why do you use, which everybody's kind of familiar with, mm -hmm. why, why would you use a, a, a scientific term in that? <laughs> Manager Miller, Board of Managers, that's a very good point, and <laughs> we do not think of that. <laughs> um, and make sure in the future we will make sure we use more. Oh, yeah. I apologize for that. Well, no, I, I just was wondering why. I think it's, uh, Manager Miller, it's a representation to a technical audience. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll just say, so, I'll, I'll use for second hand. Viewers, okay. yeah. yeah, you are soluble. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll say soluble. So don't down for us is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> you defined it as ortho. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We're good with ortho. The invisible stuff. <laughs> the stuff that's hard to see. Um, so this helps us uh, starting to uh, take out particulate and soluble phosphorus. We can start filling in our arrows more completely. So a lot of particulate phosphorus is going in, it's settling out, and less is coming out of the, uh, of, of the wetland, which is good news. However, we know that during the summer, 1, on average, 1,295 pounds of soluble phosphorus is coming out of the wetland. So two things are going on. In the, in the spring, when you're getting high flow, you're settling out particulate phosphorus. But in the summer, when your uh, uh, biological activity is going on in that wetland, you're exporting that soluble phosphorus, which is problematic. And so this is another way we looked at it. So this, this figure takes a little bit of explanation. This, any green bars, again, are particulate phosphorus. Orange bars are soluble phosphorus. 
And if it's above this line, it means it's exporting. If it's below this line, it means it's taking it out. So it, uh, during the spring, when you have that high flow and a lot of particulate phosphorus, it's removing a lot of that. But in the summer, when it warms up and uh, there's less particulate phosphorus, we're releasing uh, soluble phosphorus right into Halstead Bay. This is the period of time in which you're most susceptible to algal blooms. Mm -hmm. And so this part over here, it's great that it's removing this particulate phosphorus. However, during the summer, it takes this pool of particulate phosphorus and converts it into the time that causes al algal blooms in Halstead Bay. So not only the timing is unfortunate in that it's during the summer when the algal blooms can occur, um, it's also the form in which algae can most utilize the soluble phosphorus. So if we keep going back to this figure, we can say, okay, we're, we're, we have a pretty good idea what's going on here, and we know that the soluble phosphorus that's being released is due to the particulate settling that happens in the spring. And one of the important facts is, or uh, notes is, is if you start taking away all that particulate phosphorus, right? If you take the particulate phosphorus away from the upstream, so you're no longer loading particulate phosphorus into the wetland, the pool of particulate phosphorus is still going to be there that you've put in there before. Even if you start taking away all the orthophosphorus, you have no load coming into the wetland, it's likely that it's going to, it's going to continue exporting that phosphorus, that soluble phosphorus, because it has that historical phosphorus sitting in there waiting to be released during the summer. So that's going to continue to be released, which is going to be problematic for Halstead Bay because upstream improvements may not be seen as much as uh, this problematic historical phosphorus that you have being exported during the summer. So that's going to continue to be a problem. All right. So Brian, if you go back to, can you take the managers back to the total work? So if you look at that 1,200 or 1,300 pounds and you go to the whole Halstead Bay, that's half of the watershed load coming to Halstead Bay, mm -hmm. just to kind of give you perspective. Just from that wetland. Just from that wetland, so to taking that all away. So some of the things that we found is that Six Mile Marsh is a transform of phosphorus. It gets particulate phosphorus in the spring, is transforming it and exporting it in the summer. And it's important because that, that soluble phosphorus is being released during a period where it's most readily utilized. And so even doing upstream improvements, they may be muted just by the historic phosphorus that we have accumulated in Six Mile Marsh, even, it, even though it's a very small area. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, its impact is larger than the size of its area. And let's see, the last point here, um, I guess... By treating now, I'm going to step out here. So by treating that ortho, the soluble phosphorus with alum, as, you, as the board and Anna Brown has been working with Three Rivers Park District, putting that alum treatment plant will make those improvements in um, Halstead Bay. It's going to treat that all soluble phosphorus so it won't be active in Halstead Bay. Okay. So, and with that... Can, can, can I ask a real stupid question? Yeah. Uh, so we, we've dropped the, the load coming in with the treatment, say. Yeah. Uh, but you now got the same problem in Halstead Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't get any additional, but you get you get the the deposits are already there. Uh, Manager Miller, Board of Managers, yes, that's correct. Uh, so what do we do uh, then with Halstead Bay? Dredge it. I believe we still have to address the common carp manage, uh, address the common carp and manage that population. And then I, I don't want to speak for planning, but I believe there was talk of you still have to dose alum in Halstead Bay as well. So you treat the water going into Halstead Bay, but then also dose alum Bay or Halstead Bay as well. Yeah. So you still have to treat the upstream sources. Um, so if I can finish my presentation, now it will actually wrap and hopefully address your question. Pardon? If I can finish my presentation, sure. the presentation we can. I think that'll address your question, Manager Miller. Manager Olson, real quick though. Uh, does phosphorus, does the ortho or the um, soluble phosphorus ever condensate out of water? 
Once it's in the body of water, does it just stay suspended? Uh, uh, it usually gets taken up by algae pretty quickly. Yeah, the surface waters usually have, you you can't find much soluble phosphorus in the surface because it's being consumed. That's where you, when you <coughs> sample at the bottom of the lake, that's where you see the higher no, the So larger. when we see an algae bloom, that's actually that suspended phosphorus going away mm -hmm. being consumed by the algae. And then it settles out at the that bottom of the lake. Okay. <coughs> does, it, does it go to the bottom of the lake when the algae dies? Or? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's uh, what causes the internal loading in lakes. The, Historic so load. There's, so, there, so there's there's both the there's, both, there's both, both phosphorus being flushed so in. So it can be condensed down. That's the major rate. But the soluble, I'm just saying it back so I get in my head. The soluble water, the, the soluble phosphorus that, that is flowing in, percolates down after it's been consumed. Yep, and then. And joins the. Yeah, it joins it joins the new historic yes. pool of phosphorus at the bottom of the lake, and then gets back, and back then gets released due to microbial activity at the back of the lake, and then algae consume it. Yeah, and, it it. <laughs> yeah. and then the fish are down there doing this all the time. <laughs> yeah. So these study results are I'm going to tie them back to what the work the planning the work the planning has been doing in the Six Mile Creek Halstead Bay because their implementation strategy addresses your concerns about Halstead Bay and this marsh. Um, so the location of the Allen plant, so the result of this study narrowed the result of the possibilities of the location for the Allen treatment plant, because the feasibility study, if you recall, was suggesting, oh, we could potentially put that Allen treatment on our property that we own, save the district money, or it could be at the outlet of the um, marsh. But this study shows that because this marsh exports soluble phosphorus, large amounts of soluble phosphorus, we want to put that Allen treatment plant <coughs> at the outlet. Um, the results were communicated with planning staff roughly around the same time that Three Rivers Park District approached the district about purchasing property in that exact location, in that exact area. So again, research and monitoring and planning are working together to make sure that when there's opportunities that they have the data to back up those opportunities. So like I was mentioning the implementation strategy, so um, this is sort of a wrap-up slide to show uh, to demonstrate what's been done in the Halstead, in the excuse me, in the Six Mile Creek Halstead Bay, uh, it's a watershed. So the Sard Sands, um, the staff applied for a Lasard Sands grant, and the council recommended funding. Cart management work will begin in July of 2018. Um, we have to reduce upstream sources. Um, Anna Brown has been working with the city of Victoria and other agencies to, I believe, reduce 7% of the load of phosphorus to Wasserman Lake, as well as create parkland. And then we've been working with the Rivers Park District to purchase property for the future location of an Allen treatment plant. So work is being done to address those concerns in Halstead Bay. So with that, we'll take any questions or comments. Thank you. Actually, Kelly, can, I, can you jump back to something? Yeah. Uh, Manager Miller, I want to make sure I get to your question here. So, kind of the question is, is that we're going to have all this, all this dissolved phosphorus come out here, and we have dissolved phosphorus in, in Halstead Bay. So, the goal would be is first you're attacking the carp, because if you put an alum, that would seal. So that recirculation Brian is mentioning of dissolved phosphorus kind of going down and coming back up. By putting alum on there, you seal it down. But the seal is only as good as the seal without carp. Carp will then break that seal and then. It. So what we do is then isolate the loading that you have in the lake here too, and then by grabbing that dissolved component of it, we would get a significant amount of the loading that would come to Halstead Bay. While doing the watershed restoration, will help limit that particulate, that large particulate amount that we have coming in. So we're kind of taking it all at different fronts, but knowing that there's a sequence where we can make sure that the investments. Correct. Thank you. Would you point out the Farm Hill Circle property? Uh, the, the right at the bottom of this arrow. Yep, right there. This one right here? Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Where, where are we in that uh, land? Uh, I'm Ms. Railer. I'm going to defer that question to Anna Brown. Uh, Manager Miller and Board of Managers, uh, Three Rivers Park District is still sorting through some of the title corrections. Um, everything is on track. It just takes a little bit of time. Um, the big next step is that they have submitted um, a preliminary plat application to the city um, to create those uh, two parcels. Um, and once that's complete, I think sometime early in the new year, we're probably at that point trending towards closing with, with Three Rivers. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Well, uh, so, sure. we're, so we're going to we're treating it, uh, the uh, d uh, upstream lakes. We've got a whole big, and then we're treating uh, the water coming out of Six Mile Creek, and then we're treating Halsted's Bay. This is the plan. That yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, t ten years from now, in X number of dollars. Uh, What's going to be the quality of the water in Halsted's Bay? Well, first, those two yellow arrows are going to get really. <laughs> <laughs> yellow arrows. That's way there they are. The They're going to but shrink. Kelly, you want to go to the lower? Yeah. Go to the big arrows. So the, oh. the goal is, is the, at the treatment facility is meant to be a 30 year investment. That wouldn't be run forever. Um, so keep going to the, the big box. Oh, sure. There you go. Yeah, but then you have to put all the arrows here. So the objective would be is um, put the plant in place to grab this big chunk of phosphorus that comes out there. We can diminish that and then limit the 400, or, you know, get 400 pounds of particulate. All the while, that number would be compressing as well. Um, and then while we're doing watershed restoration activities upstream, we start to shrink this 1,800 down significantly as we start to work in mud, parley, and deal with the curb. So. Ideally, so if you keep going back to the big circle, oh. it's, no. it's turkey time, so we like pies, so let's do the pie chart. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> keep hungry. You gotta think <clears throat> so, yeah, you had it right there. Yeah, so by, de by dealing with um, the uh, outlet here, we'll shrink this number significantly, <coughs> and a journal load will probably get um, anywhere between 50 to 60% of it. So. I mean, what you can see is that by implementing projects, we'll start to cleave this in half, if not by 60%. Uh, so that'll significantly improve the water quality. Of that. Correct. Yeah. And district staff will be continuing to monitor Halston Bay, so we can actually then show you results. Okay, now, uh, as I understand, we're, we, we dosed the bottom of a lake with alum. Would you, in two sentences, there's a challenge. Explain how the dosing system takes deals with the suspended phosphorus in the water that's coming. So alum is it's put out in uh, different. It's a, a liquid injection system, so mm -hmm. they, it's a control that goes through the lake. As you spread the alum in the lake, it grabs the, the soluble phosphorus and it becomes a particulate, the alum bond, uh, so the phosphorus, and then seals it to the bottom. Right. So what you're doing is you're essentially just stripping the water column of the phosphorus, and then it settles on the bottom and forms a permanent seal. My question is, though, is how does the dosing station work? How does this, oh, the dosing station. Yeah. Oh, you're so testing me. Um, <laughs> it goes into the, the bottom. We'll pull from the bottom of the wetland, pull that water up, and then do the injection of the alum at the plant, and then reinsert that water back into the wetland. So now it's it's bonded. It's yep. running into Halstead's Bay, and then it starts to settle up. Actually, we'll settle it up on the property through okay. the clarifier system, and then put the clean water back into the wetland. Outstanding. So we're not even. That it doesn't actually get back into the system. And then we haul that away. Actually, what we're proposing to do is we would put it into the sanitary line mm -hmm. that runs through the property. Thank you. So when Nora can. Sorry. Much better. So when the phosphorus is bonded to the alum, mm -hmm. what causes it to break that bond? Well, Brian's the chemist, so I'm gonna let him jump in. But it's the it's essentially the chemical. Um, Ionic properties between the bond of phosphorus and alum is so strong when they come into contact, it actually locks it down. But <coughs> Brian, you're the chemist. So but does that understand. bond last eternally? You'd have to have really unusual conditions, non-environmental conditions, for that to break up. Usually low, low, low pH yeah, will low cause that bond to break. Or physically stirring it up. Perfect. And then the carpet. Yeah. 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 So those are the two mechanisms. That's why addressing the carp first before going into the alum is key. And then ensuring um, when you do do the dosing that the pH is maintained. And, and I think Dr. Sorensen's lab said that was the highest uh, density of carp population they've ever measured. So. Which is why carp management will begin next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, Four. thanks for the presentation. Do you want to replace carp? I should, I, I'm sorry. I like, do I, I'm only asking that thinking of, of Lake Nokomis, where there was a there was a huge carp harvesting. There, the introduction of. of game fish didn't balance out and 
global population spiked, and if I'm remembering correctly. Um, actually, we did a biomanipulation in... Yeah. Oh, sorry, Manager Chuck and Board Board Manders. We um, actually were able to balance out the fish were community. They? Okay. Um, recent results from the past, like, five, six years have shown statistical improvements in phosphorus yeah. as well as chlorophyll concentrations in the lake. Clarity is what's not... Right, it's still below the standard. Um, the new park board, Minneapolis Park, park and Recreation Board, as well as the district... And a consultant, I believe, WSB is working on a carp study as well in okay. the Nokomis area. Because we believe, don't quote me on this, but that uh -huh. carp get in the system during high water and then get trapped in Lake Nokomis during low water, and that's where they become detrimental. It can be damaging to the system. Is, I, is my memory about bluegills just off? No, they were extremely high, and by us going in and stocking the, uh, with fish. walleye, we helped rebalance that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. The next item under consideration is 11.1 um, on our agenda, Resolution 17 071, mm -hmm. and we have um, Anna Brown. Thank you, President White Managers. Um, I'm seeking approval of the design scope for the Wester Wasserman West uh, Park and Natural Resource Improvement Project. Um, and also uh, seeking authorization to award the uh, design uh, contract to Wank with Hart Howerton acting as a subcontractor. Um, I presented this to uh, the Board of Managers at the board workshop uh, at our last meeting on November 9th, um, and the board supported moving this for final action. Um, so I'm happy to answer any uh, residual questions. Uh, there weren't any modifications between um, the last meeting and today. Um, so I can answer questions and otherwise um, I'm here to entertain that motion. Motion to approve. Can I, can I restate my motion from last <laughs> meeting when I jumped the gun? Uh, I move approval. <laughs> I forgot that. <laughs> Is there a second to Manager Olson's shy motion? <clears throat> second to Manager Rodman's discussion? Those <clears throat> in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Now we will turn to the added agenda item, which is uh, the Big Island um, letter. And we all received a copy of that draft. So, open for discussion. Well, I'll lead off. Um, I had um, thought that we might want to change the focus of this letter to more clearly match the motion which had us talking about the ecological or environmental value and um, emphasizing that we are intent on enforcing this easement. And so the letter could be modified to talk about the purpose for the easement um, and what what environmental issue or water quality issue is posed by the actions the city took rather than just listing them as infringements and then delineating specifically what they did without characterizing it as um, restoration or correction but just the we could attach the um, report from staff and um, state what steps concrete steps they have taken um, since um, and then emphasize that we will use whatever legal enforcement we need to, if necessary, for any past, present, or future um, violation of the easement. Um, we also want to uh, reach out and provide some information or education and, and stress that we want to work with the city um, as the city and the district um, created this wonderful resource at the same time. Um, and we want to keep moving forward with that. Um, Also, it talks about shoreline work, and I think it should say shoreline stabilization. And I have a question about, we did two projects with Orono and Three Rivers, and the draft letter, does it talk about one or the other or both, and is that dollar figure assigned, separated out? The letter does refer to two, one, what, a $700,000 project for bluff stabilization, and an $850,000 project for, for acquisition and initial 
Which is nothing to do with Three Rivers. It's just the portion well, here's, that's not Here's what the draft said. In 2008 and again in 2013, the district, in partnership with the city of, I'm sorry, the district, in partnership with Three Rivers, stabilized the shoreline using riprap and plantings. And the if, additional shoreline. If the city project was in 2008, should this letter <coughs> say 2008 of the city and give the correct dollar figure for that restoration? That was the 700000 That was 700000 okay. 850 was way west where Three Rivers has. And that's on the north side of the island, not the south and northeast side mm -hmm. of the island. Well, so, I would so, in yeah. so there was the purchase price, the, the initial uh, uh, restoration and, sh and shoreline stabilization, and then the third project was the... Uh, Three Rivers. Three on, Rivers. On the west side of Cruises Cove. Okay, so it's, it's all on the same asset. It's just different ownerships. Two different parks. Yeah, but it's the same asset, the Big Island in right. the middle of Lake Minnetonka. Uh, so I would I would suggest that we use the entire number because it represents what the public investment is out there in the shoreline and uh, and um, on, on on public lands that were purchased with funds. It's part of a bigger part of a bigger thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a lot more than the 850 and the 750 and the I don't know what that's. Anybody remember what the other third one was? No. <clears throat> we can get that information. Lots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I don't think that's misrepresenting anything, do you? No, if it's spelled out, which it yeah. is, yeah. So the action we took last week was to get a draft, <coughs> bring it back to the board for review and approval. Um, <coughs> and I would be willing to take a whack at um, the letter, 